Welcome to One on One. I am your host, Jimmy Olson, and today I have the opportunity to chat with Alex Weib. Alex is with Alex Weib and Associates. He is at acweib.org. He's been working as a consultant for, for a few years with both nonprofit and for-profit companies to kind of like really help them kind of, we'll say, get their ducks in a row, Alex. Does that sound about right? Absolutely. Yep. That's uh, about the best way to say it. <laughs> so Alex, how are you doing, man? Great. Good to hear your voice again. We, uh, it's been a while. It has been. So, you know, what have you been doing to keep yourself busy amongst the changes happening in the world right now? <laughs> yeah, that change is the operative word. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Uh, haven't seen anything so disruptive, uh, literally ever. As long as we've been alive, there probably hasn't been anything this, uh, this disruptive to the business world. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, working, we, uh, we, we've heard of a few other things, but I mean, we've had other pandemics and different things when you look through history, history, but you're right. I mean, there's nothing that has affected people both personally and professionally like this has. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we were already seeing some components of this take place, uh, slowly and surely. Um, and, and now just kind of everything triggered and fell all at once and some of it's good. Some of it might be good eventually. Uh, and then others are certainly, like I said, disruptive might be the only way to say it. Can't really say whether or not it's going to be bad or not. Now uh, we'll have to wait and see how it turns out. In the future. But, uh, yeah. Certainly topsy turvy is a, uh, is a good way to put it. And, and, try and to help that's really folks. the way it's still going because even as we're trying to find a way to, to advance with dealing with the whole pandemic, you know, with the coronavirus and how businesses are trying to get things going and stay starting to open back up almost um, everything is open. Even if it is still restricted to say 50% or less, depending on that, what is it's, it, it's really trying to, they're, they're still finding new information every day and, we're not sure what's going to happen when we get the fall, which is part of a lot of the things to, to chat, chat about. But one, And we'll get to that piece here momentarily. But first, I want to kind of get into this whole WFM, work from home, which I, I'm sure you have had many conversations with companies over the years because we've heard about it. I mean, I've got friends at Principal. I've got friends at Wells Fargo you know, the big companies that have been toying with the whole work from home thing. Best Buy did it years ago with everybody working from home. And then they kind of pulled everybody back in. And I've got friends at Wells Fargo. Again, they've worked from home. Now you're work back in the office. Now you're back at home again. They just like, you're not sure. It's like dipping that toe in there. But now they were forced to just both feet dive in. You're done. Work from home. Now we've got companies that are basically saying, A, it's work that's, from home yeah, until further it. notice because we're not sure how all this is going to play out with, with the virus, especially as we get back into fall. But two, now it's like companies are saying, it's not just until further notice, we're just going to leave it like this. I mean, what are your feelings? What have you thought through your conversations with the whole work from home? Sure. The... Uh... I think work from home is awesome. Um, from the time I uh, retired from active duty uh, in the Navy to um, essentially the the role I'm filling right now, I worked from home for that entire period. And that was almost four years. So I had a boss I'd never met. I had coworkers that I've never physically seen in a room. Uh, we managed everything really pretty well. Uh, some studies show that that if you're in that sort of virtual team environment, you actually communicate more than if you're in an office setting. And so I think a lot of companies have seen that. They haven't seen a decrease in productivity. They haven't seen people going home and slacking off. And yeah, you get to work from your pajamas, but you don't get to work while you're sleeping. You know, I think the big idea was, hey, if we let people work from home, we're going to go back to old school, you know, theory X management that people don't want to work unless we're standing behind them and looking over their shoulder the whole time and forcing them to actually sit at their keyboard and type or, you know, sit in the line and pick up the boxes and put them over there. And that, that sort of management style is really out the window. Um, now, even when the internet came around, they, they, they were going around offices and downloading software to find out whether or not you were, you know, looking at fantasy football or, you know, whatever sort of distraction, Facebook, social media, they, they wanted to find out how many hours you were 
goofing off at work, let's say. But yeah, then how they many found, hours you were actually working? You bet that, that after the fact, people would maybe waste two hours at work checking their Facebook or or doing whatever. And then uh, in the evenings, though, they were able to come back and dial back to their machines and take care of that little bit of job that the boss called up and said, hey, you know, I need this thing. Can you just send it to me right now? So it really balanced out. You were still getting the same amount of work hours from folks. They might have goofed off for two hours in the middle of the day. But then again, they didn't mind doing those two hours in the evening when you, you know, needed this email finished or this document reviewed or whatever else. So there really was a good trade-off. Uh, IBM famously had workspace for only 40% of their employees. Mm. So 60% of IBM's employees for, for a long time were out in the field. Their, their office literally was their house or, you know, their client location or wherever they were at. What IBM did there was they offloaded all of those expenses. So they didn't need to pay rent for 60% of their employees. They were either on the customer site where the customer paid the rent, paid for their computer, paid for their electricity and their parking spot, or they were working from home where, where all of that was on the individual. And, and a lot of companies now, like you said, they had this thrust upon them. And so instead of maintaining these empty offices, uh, I've heard there's going to be kind of an, I don't know, an Armageddon. <laughs> Is that the right word? Well, some sort of cutoff. Some, some days it feels like it, I swear. And <laughs> yeah. So, so there, there's going to be a commercial real estate trouble in the future because all these companies like Twitter, they realize we don't need to pay this rent. You know, we don't need to have all these people in this room. They can be everywhere else. And then, then we can just pay them slightly more to cover their internet cost or their electricity or whatever else. And we don't have to fight for parking spots. We don't have to fight for uh, office space. All of those millions of dollars in expenses just evaporate. Well, and, and it's it, not just uh, Twitter. I mean, fa Facebook has come out with the exact same thing. They're going, you know what? This whole work from home thing is working. And now rocks, they're basically yeah. talking about downsizing. Pretty much the only thing that that cannot go away are the server farms because they have to have <laughs> the storage for all of sure. the information that's going on Facebook. Twitter would be the same thing. Google would be the same thing. But, yeah, I mean, I think, number one, even if you buy the building, you've got the insurance overhead. You have, you know, what are you, the upkeep of the building that you need to pay for? I mean, Absolutely, if you think yeah. about it over a while, if they pay you either a a little more or even pay for your internet for their employees over the long haul i mean i see some some dollars being saved oh absolutely and when we think about um you know large massive companies like uh like like wells fargo um when when you and i met uh we we're both living in the same area and I interviewed for a whole lot of jobs at Wells Fargo, and only about a third of those jobs actually required you to be in one specific location. Most of them were, hey, you have to be able to get yourself to a Wells Fargo office. Mm -hmm. So we don't care where you are at nationwide. If you can go to a place where there's a Wells Fargo office, you can have this job. So they were already looking at, I guess you could call it ultra remote. So you were responsible for being in the office three days a week, whatever office it was. Your boss was at the headquarters in San Francisco. Your coworkers were in Minneapolis and Charlotte, and I'm trying to think of all the other big Wells Fargo hubs. Can't think of them. But, you know, you, as long as you can physically get to one of those for a couple of days a week, it's cool. We got this. So moving from that super remote, highly mobile, we don't really care where you live mentality to a, hey, look, dude, just do it in your basement. We don't care. It's not that big of a leap. And, and I think they've found that it's, it's already very successful. Uh, I share this with a lot of people. You know, I, I retired from the Navy. We talked about that already. My, maybe the last 12 years I spent on active duty, unless I was in a, a deployable unit that actually, you know, picked up all their toys and went somewhere and did stuff. When, when I was at a regular desk job working for the military, I could have been doing it from Timbuktu. It didn't matter. Uh, I could be doing it from the beach in a lawn chair. It was essentially remote work. We all just did it from the same building. And that's kind of the position Wells Fargo was in where, you know, you're in a building with a bunch of other people sitting at desks that we pay for, but you don't have to be, you know, you can literally do this from anywhere. And here I was, you know, essentially a government employee as an active duty service member. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I was dealing with people that were in 18, not 18, 12 different time zones in eight different countries in this, you know, two jobs that I had, it was the same type of job doing the same type of stuff. Zero people I dealt with me except my, my immediate boss. Uh, we're in the same place. They were all over the world, and I could have been easily doing it from home. And right now, click that button, and you can.
<laughs> well, and I know a lot of, especially when it comes to the project managers and things like that. I mean, again, I've got a, a friends at Wells Fargo, and as soon as they were hired, they work from home. Now, the only time I think they have to be in the office one time a month for a manager for a, for a meeting, but outside of that, they never go in to the office. In fact, there yeah. was a a, 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 guy, a project manager that I was chatting to that. He said when he had to go in for his meeting, he did not even have a space. He had to find a chair in a corner. I mean, they didn't even have like desk space that he could borrow when he went in. <laughs> but I mean, but I, I mean, I guess yeah. that's where that next step comes into with this whole thing. I mean, now these companies that have figured it out, they found that it worked. They found in the long haul that they can save money. I mean, do you see? for the foreseeable future that, you know, the principals, the Wells Fargo's, the Facebook's, the, you know, IBM's, you know, fill in the space here are going to, if you work in the office, I mean, HP has been doing it for years, even with the customer service, because they're able to answer the phone through their computer with these, you know, USB microphones, headsets. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And, yeah. and again, and, they don't have to have a place. I mean, so is that what you're seeing things moving towards? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, in, in that same uh, IBM review where they looked at, you know, people getting the same amount of work hours in the office as they were at home, um, they, they came down to the conclusion that you really only work six hours a day anyway. Mm -hmm. So uh, in an eight hour day, you know, people have a 50 minute break in the morning and the afternoon. That's just kind of an American tradition. Um, and, and kind of, you know, it's a law. Labor laws. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, and, you you know, and, you to, and you have to have a lunch. And which usually right. a lot of them, have, they're not the, the full 60 minute lunches anymore. A lot of them have it's cut 30, them down to the yeah. 30 minute lunches. Sure. So, you know, whether or not your company pays for that time, that, that all depends on some stuff. But when it comes down to it, you have all the other things, too. Mm -hmm. So you have the stop buys. You have the boss that comes in and says, hey, you know, I want to make some time and build some rapport. What do you think about that game last night? You know, mm -hmm. what would you do this weekend? And then you got the guy, you know, down the cubicle. I'm saying guy because the one that I deal with most often is a man. Right. Um, <laughs> but this could be anybody, right? Who just exactly. sits there and tells tells you every single thing they did for the weekend. And uh, we've tracked this particular individual in our office and he wastes an hour, usually in the morning and an hour in the afternoon. So that is, uh, let's see, 10, it's one and a half work days that we have to sit and listen to him tell his stories. And it's wonderful and fun and cool, but that's all <laughs> wasted time that right. right now you don't have to deal with because the guy who's doing all that stuff or the lady who's doing that stuff, depending on the situation, they're somewhere else, man. They're not in your business taking time from your day. And so, yeah, six hours of work is all they ever expend, all they ever expected, you know, from, from any of their employees, mm -hmm. because they knew that's really all you were getting done anyway. So now we're sitting at home and if you can get six hours of work at whatever hours you want to put it in, good. You know, it, it makes it all the better because you're doing it somewhere else. And I really don't see us turning back from that. Uh, well, there's, I, I there's mean, companies large and small. If you don't actually, physically have to be in the location like you talked about the it server, server farms you need somebody there making sure that if this goes bad i can replace it right. you know, maintenance type work with with the servers and the hardware short of that if you don't actually have to be there there's no reason why you you will be there in the future i, I really see it going long distance the definitely to work from home well and, and when you're looking at the server farms and things like that i mean really if you think about it they're almost like an overpaid babysitter because I, I know somebody that does it and they really, they don't, they, they're not doing anything unless a drive goes down. They go to that drive, they pull the drive, put a new drive in, and then they go back. I mean, they're basically playing video games all day. I mean, nice. or, or whatever. But again, when you're looking at the tech side of things, that's the way it works. I mean, it's, it, there's, there can be a lot of work at certain times, but for the most time, part of that, you're not really doing a lot of pieces to, to kind of throw all this together. I mean, you have a little more downtime because things work so smoothly and it's, you could almost say more automated. Yeah, you bet. The, uh, um, so we have, uh, three adult children that work in, in professional settings. Uh, one of them is a project manager for a construction company. I think there's eight people in the, 
in the company and they've all been forced to work from home. Uh, and, and the, the owners travels around to all the construction sites and make sure all the subs are doing their job. And so she's one of the eight people or seven people rather, who are sitting in the office kind of tracking things as they go. Oh. She's been doing that from home and they've already told her, don't expect to come back. We're going to keep the office, but keep doing what you're doing. Stay where you're at. Uh, another one works in a factory. Uh, she does quality control at a food processing plant. Um, she has to go in and actually, you know, swab drains as she likes to say it because somebody literally has to make sure that there's no e coli in the sure. food plant i mean that's right unavoidable so we have one who's already been told all you do is on the computer and the phone stay at home and keep doing that uh you know daughter number two is the one who literally has a physical job that has to be done every single day several times a day and so they're working out a rotation so they don't have to be there every single day right somebody right. has to do that work it just doesn't have to be the same individual you know, and then we got a, a third one who works in a uh, a family owned uh, company that does kitchens and baths. Mm -hmm. uh, they're working nonstop because people are stuck at home looking at their kitchen, thinking, "Huh, this is old. I should replace it." So, right. in one hand, you know, <laughs> business has been great for them. It's, um, this is good for me. Stay at home. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, so one slammed with people that want other folks to come to their house and do the work. We got one that's kind of halfway in between that has to do a job. You know consistently every day because it has to be done and then another one who's eh, you know don't care if we ever see you again uh, so i really maybe it'll be one of those three variants for for everybody in america you know th there are jobs that you literally there's no other option they have to get done and they have to get done in person you know doctoring you know construction that sort of thing it it, it has to be done and there's no way to avoid it um, and you can't really do it from home uh, but then there's the occasional folks and Hey, you come in when you got to come in, like you're talking about your friends at Wells Fargo. You come in for the meeting, we might not have a desk for you, but, uh, but you got to show up no matter what, you know, this, this occasional period of time. And then they got the other folks, um, you know, folks like me who quite literally worked for somebody for four years and have never shaken hands or met them in a room or, or even seen them in reality. So, well, I mean, just think about it. I mean, there's been salespeople that have been doing this for years. Yeah, you would have to go in, we'll say you have a, a daily sales meeting. But the reality is you, there is no desk because they want you on the street knocking on doors, making those sales. I mean, radio, which of course, I mean, you know, that's what my background is dealing with media. I mean, you're going to see probably a lot of a mixture with that because being on the air, you know, I can't have my, you know, soundboard at home to be able to mess with the controls where so because you know i've got to have certain control with that but mm -hmm. the other people you know like sales people or you know you know business people that are more on the administrative side that because it's all cloud-based or from home they'd be able to work at home so now you've had this big office space that you can cut down to you know 50 percent. and again we're talking you're saving money on rent you're saving utilities you're saving you know fill in the blank of what you're going to save. And I mean, you kind of started say, talking about it earlier where this is going to put the commercial real estate market. Yeah. Oh yeah. They're, they're going to be, going to be in jeopardy. Um, you know, one of the other large events that's, that's happened here in my lifetime, uh, it was uh, September 11th. Mm -hmm. So September 11th, 2001, um, you know, amongst other things that changed the airline industry, changed forever. So they received a, a huge federal bailout. And along with that federal bailout, um, they, they had to make a few changes and they decided to make several other changes. You want to think most people don't realize the airlines make most of their money on cargo. So mm -hmm. the reason why United wants to charge you $50 a bag is to discourage you from taking a bag so that they can put more, you know, UPS or FedEx packages underneath the plane. Um, sure. They that's that's why they're running empty planes now. When when people don't want to fly, they're like, "Wow, two people on the plane. How can you afford to do this?" Well, it's full of boxes. We just didn't want to tell you that. But uh, so, you know, that that's your AM air mail. That's your you know your next day, your your FedEx mm -hmm. 10 a.m. delivery sort of things, right? All those go in unused airline cargo space. So when there wasn't that, uh, they had to come up with a way to do things like, "Hey, overnight this document." So forever and ever and ever, the government was resisting this PDF and scan. So you could send a fax signature, and that was totally cool, but you couldn't send a scan and PDF 
signature, which didn't really make any sense and everybody knew it, but they were resisting it. But then once September 11th happened and stuff couldn't go out, it was either stop the world or just simply let people do PDF and scan as a valid physical signature for legal documents. Easy choice, right? Right. You'd think. But it took, yeah, you'd think, but it took that disruptive of an event and shutting the world down to allow people to see, hey, this is kind of a good deal and it's a necessity. So that's just one example of several of the things that happened on the backside of, of September 11th when all they did literally was stop air travel for a certain period of time. Sure. There, there were other things that they sh shut down and stopped too, but for the most part, you know, it, it, it takes some of these big events for people to realize, hey, the way we did this was kind of stupid. You know, well, we're seeing... Um, we're seeing restaurants and uh, bars uh, be allowed to do things that, you know, the state alcohol control board were lost their minds about uh, a couple of weeks ago. So right. just as a way to allow restaurants to keep making food, they said, hey, you can keep making takeout. And then a lot of restaurant owners said, hey, thanks. We make hardly anything on the food. We make a whole lot on selling drinks. So uh, where we live, they allowed everybody to sell um, – drinks to go, which it's legal in like four states and this isn't one of them. <laughs> well, and so here in, and, and you're out on the East Coast now and, and you were in Iowa when you and I first met. They did the same yeah, thing yeah, here. Bet. They did drinks to go. You're at a, a bar grill, so you're getting your takeout. In fact, it got to the point that they were even doing marketing things on the internet of, you know, get a pizza and a six pack to go. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, got the other part of that is it's not just the drinks to go, but you've got this beer sitting in a cooler that no one's yeah. coming oh, yeah. in. It's going to get stale after a while. And now what are they going to do with it? But Right. So one of our, one of our places that we go to here, yep. Living in Virginia now. Um, and, and we like it. It's wonderful. The, uh, uh, a little bar and grill that's, that's right near our house. Um, they allowed all of those places to sell growlers where before that was absolutely unbelievably prohibited. So they could sell you a half gallon or a quart of your favorite mm -hmm. beer and they, they'd put it in a jug and twist the top on, send you on your way. You can do that at a brewery, but you can't do it at regular old bar. Uh, there, there are a couple of States that allow you to do that. I mean, shoot, we lived in Louisiana and uh, Louisiana, they'd put uh you know, a daiquiri or a margarita in a foam cup like you get at Casey's and they just put tape over the top because that made right. it a, quote, closed container. Um, <laughs> you know, so, so there's that, right? And so here, they wouldn't even let bars sell beer and growlers. And now, the, just to keep them alive and open, yeah, you can go to any bar and get any growler filled with anything you want. They'll even allow them to put mixed drinks into that growler. And I don't know who needs 64 ounces of mojito or uh, margarita, but God bless them. If they can do that, all the power to them. Uh, well, you know, it depends uh, on how hard of a day that was working from home. Uh, <laughs> I need that 64 ounces of yeah. a Malibu sunset just to kind of get me through the rest of that day. I mean, it's hard to say. Sure, sure. Well, I yeah, mean, and you know, I, I'm not making any disparaging statements about Mexican food, but we don't go to the Mexican food because we like the tacos. You know, right. we, we go there because we like the whole atmosphere of it, right? I like the chips and salsa at the table. I like talking to the, uh, to their folks that are there, you know, the, the food's always great. Like the margaritas, it's, it's the entirety of the event. And right. if all I can do is get some, you know, to go uh, tacos and burritos that I could probably get somewhere else or even make it home. Uh, no thanks to Wanta, but you know, right. taking home 64 ounces of margarita makes it a lot more fun. So, <laughs> well, so I mean, basically <laughs> as we're seeing this, this whole work from home thing, I mean, and even thing reports that I've heard and read it, it, it's going to be around a while. And I, again, kind of like how um, it, something happens that causes companies to go, wait a minute, we've been talking about it. Now we're doing it and look how well it's working. So, I mean, we've got that working into the future, but now let's look at a different side of that because speaking of the restaurants, so things, you know, and of course the state had to change a few things to, to make that work for some of the bars and grills. But now, you know, this is not something that most companies are going to, snap back from in the next six months to a year if not even a couple years because i even know at least in the in the midwest here where i am in central iowa i mean they're talking at least on the radio side that in that in the media area this is going to affect us for at least a couple years 
So depending on that company and where they're going or what, you know, widgets they're selling or whatever it is, I mean, how are they going to need to, you know, strategically plan? We know they're going to get hurt, but how, what are they going to need to do to not feel the, the pressure or the pain as bad as it could be? Sure. Uh, that's a very common question. And as a business consultant, that's one of the questions that I get asked a lot. I kind of assume that, that, Alex. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, By the way, before we get the- too far, I, I'm talking with Alex Weib, with Alex Weib and Associates, and uh, just kind of going over, you know, the, the work from home thing and a lot of different other pieces. So, so right now we're, we're having the conversation, you know, how do we need a plan to plan to make it through to the other end and not be hurt so bad? Right. So the way I can describe it in an easy and understandable way is let's just pretend, you know, that you and your spouse are about to get a divorce and you're walking into the courthouse and you look to each other and say, hey, maybe we should think this out. Right. Mm-hmm. So so that's businesses now. Right. So the business is the spouse who's, you know, thinks that they didn't do anything wrong. And, and the, you know, the virus and all this other stuff is the spouse that also thinks they did nothing wrong. So it, it's. It's just a situation that's going to hurt. There's no way around it and there's no way through it. And, you know, as a consultant, we get asked this all the time. Hey, how do we do this? And, you know, come out of it unscathed. Well, you can't. You know, yeah, there's, I mean, there's, there's, there's no, no way. You're, right. you're going to feel the, no. the pain. No matter what, there's going to be pain. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and thinking that you can get out of it on the backside quickly and fastly, quickly, <laughs> rapidly, uh, and then <laughs> without a whole lot of pain, you bet. It's a complete fallacy. So buckle up and embrace it and do the best you can and come out with as few scars as possible. That's step one. Just, just knowing that there's going to be some really, really hard decisions that every company is going to have to make. Uh, Amazon seems to be doing fine out of all this and maybe some of the other like Lowe's. Oh my gosh. Um, We don't have a home Depot there where we live, but we got a Lowe's and that place. I've never seen it more full. Mm -hmm. Um, So apparently you can't catch anything there, but well, so, I think yeah, it goes back to what you were saying. People are working from home and they're seeing little things that, wow, you know, I needed <laughs> to get that done or that's not looking. Maybe we need to get, get some paint and kind of like freshen this place up a little bit. <laughs> right. Yeah. The, the honeydew list got really long and the excuse is always, I don't have time. Well, now you do. So, right. Yeah. Um, so there's going to be some companies that have done really, really well during all this. And then there's everybody else. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, so the big thing is trying to, kind of strategize out where, where is the damage going to be for some that's really, really easy. So, you know, restaurants, for example, like, like you mentioned before, the s- servers got laid off, sales were cut in half, you know, and, and now there's going to be this slow ramp up in most States of how many people they can have and how much capacity. Right. So, so all of those things are just going to happen at whatever rate that, that they're allowed to be done at. And, and, and that's going to be a slow and incremental thing. So trying to define the likely pain points is really pretty easy if you sit down and, and you know, look at what's going to hurt the most, okay? What's going to hurt the second most? Now, of either of these two things, is there a side effect? Is there a side effect of that side effect? So if you try to figure out the two or three things that are really going to be the biggest hit and then the side effects of that uh, and then the side effects of those – um, that'll really narrow it down to where you need to focus your time and effort because there's going to be some of those side effects that you really can't do anything about, you know? So you had to lay off most of your employees and you can only bring back so many at a time. Mm-hmm. You're going to lose good help. You're going to lose people that really know what they're doing, you know, and we're not only talking restaurants, but they're just a really great example for this. Right. So if you have a restaurant, you had 12 good servers that you could really count on. You had probably another five that were okay, and then a bunch of other ones that you were probably going to be really glad that they're gone. So obviously those that you don't care about or that weren't the great employees anyway, don't need to worry about them. The ones that were okay, worry about them if you can bring it back too. But, you know, it comes down to those 12 hardcore employees that you really, really liked and were really, really good people. And if you have to lay off half of them, that it is, it's just going to hurt. There's, there's no way around it. So trying to, to plan and project, okay, what are the side effects of not bringing those people in? You know, is that really going to hurt your system or your service? If we're talking about a restaurant where everything's pretty straightforward, it's probably not going to be that big of a deal. Um, 
if you're talking about media sales, uh, I don't really know the media sales work. I just know that it can be real and niche mm -hmm. stuff. So, you know, you've developed a relationship with some of these businesses for a very long time. And now all of a sudden that person is gone. You just can't snap your fingers and have those relationships grow back. And well, I mean, on the give... flip side and the flip side of that too, though, is, you know, not only when it comes down to, you know, salaries being the pieces that cut when they're looking at saving money. Another thing that gets cut is their marketing budget. So when you're looking at, Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And you're, so when you're talking television, when you're talking print, when you're talking radio, you know, e even, you know, online with digital anymore. I mean, those are things that I don't have the money to pay for advertising anymore. But the thing is, now you've got to start thinking outside the box of, well, if I'm not paying for advertising, I still got to get the word out there of what I do and that we're still here and available. I mean, I, I don't know that this is going to be an easy answer to like figure all this out. And I mean, I'm sure if, you know, somebody wants to reach out to, Alex and go, I got a question. <laughs> you know, I mean, but it, it, it's what I, I mean, cause I don't, it, it, I, this is something that I don't see that it's number one, a quick and simple answer. Number two, it's probably something that once you figure out a plan, you're going to have to revisit it, you know, almost weekly because again, we're still getting more information every day, learning something new. I mean, so we're not even, sh and, and, and we're talking, we're starting summer now. What's it going to look like in the fall? Because that's <laughs> yeah. the other part that everybody's concerned about because now that the cold and flu season's back, and that's one thing they've said from the beginning, this is a new strain. We have to now learn how to live with it. It's not yeah, going yeah. to go away. So right. it's not a simple thing. And in any way that you look at it. Right. Oh, absolutely. And uh, the, the, the damage is easy to predict. It's, it's hard to avoid just, just trying to find the, the hard center of mass that, uh, that's going to get impacted. And then, you know, how do you deal with the things that you can help and the things that you can't? And, right. and that's, that's really it. And the things that you can't, you know, sometimes you just got to kind of turn the other cheek and, and get smacked around a little more. Uh, but, you know, finding the things that you can actually do anything about, uh, that, that's the real key. And that's, that's really what we try to help other companies figure out is, all right, where, where's the damage going to be? What can we do about this? What can we do about that? And, and if there is anything we can do about it, then we'll just, hey, we'll just be advised. We'll keep an eye on it. But, well, it, uh, and then try to, try to do what you can. Right. Well, it's like how, what they say, it's looking at the, the things that you can control, but because there's going to be a lot of things that you're not able to, I mean, you, you're talking about, you know, finding that balance. And the problem is, you know, you, you can't find it. It's almost like a tornado, you know, that tornado. <laughs> here, here, here's the funnel. Here's where the center, you know, the, the center mass is, we know where it is. <clears throat> Wait, it moved. <laughs> what, 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 what happened that now it's now we don't know what's going on because it's not where it was and yeah you bet I, that's a great analogy uh, i mean it, exactly it really is i mean who knows alex you know dude we have been chatting and this is fantastic and i want to thank you so much for your time ladies and gentlemen yeah you too jimmy great for reaching out yeah you thanks are, good to talk to you you're listening to one-on-one. -on -one. I am your host, Jimmy Olson. Again, I've been chatting with Alex Weib from Alex Weib and Associates. You can learn more about Alex at acweib.org. That's A-C-W-I-B-E.org. And of course, we I know you mentioned about, you know, retiring from the Navy, but we didn't even discuss, you know, your the because you're a, a helicopter pilot. So I think we might have yeah. to get on again and just just talk about your military pieces. I don't know. <laughs> you it's had good some times. stories, man. Yeah. Stories. Yeah. Alex, yeah. thank you very much again. Alex Wybe from Alex Wybe and Associates, acwybe.org. Alex, you have a great day, sir, and thank you again. Ladies and gentlemen, you have been listening to One on One. I am your host, Jimmy Olson.